Gal, uh, why an investment in this is so critical. So when my son was just about to start medical school seven years ago, my best friend said to him, Alex, if you go into geriatrics, I'll pay part of your tuition. <laughs> and he looked back at her and wisely said, we are all going to be in geriatrics. <laughs> he went into his anesthesiology. So um, with that, I just want to say what a pleasure it is to be here today at my third Invest in Results event. Um, we have had an incredibly long and productive relationship with the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank over many, many years. And um, we actually had the great honor of doing the third book in the series, which you'll see in the pictures in the back of the book called What It's Worth. And we launched that event in this very room. And I will tell you that it was the first time my mother ever watched a live stream. <laughs> And I was scared that she'd be screaming loud enough from Florida, she's actually here right now, if you know, um, to like disrupt the whole system that we were doing. So it's really wonderful to be back in this room um, and be with all of you today. I also have to say that I've been a passionate admirer of the Nonprofit Finance Fund for many, many years and a long partner, because my other passion, in addition to all the work we do around financial capability and asset building, has been nonprofit financial capacity, which I do on the side all the time because it's so critical. So let me also say that none of those are the reasons why I am here which it was a concert in Washington right before the book was finalized that Anthony came down to see Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> and he found out that I was going to Bruce Springsteen as well. And with that connection, he then said, well, you have to write a chapter in the book. And that's really, with a little encouragement from David over here, how that all happened. So I know he's not here, but it is that inspiration that I'm going to use to summarize actually the journey we've been on in New York, San Francisco, and now in Washington, but also the journey in the book. One of the things I want to do is highlight what we heard today, but also highlight some of the chapters in the book that I want to make sure you pay attention to, not that you shouldn't read all of them. And this goes back to my colleague Lee Tivill, who's here, who helped with the first uh, the book we wrote, who basically said, would you circle all the chapters that I should actually read? So of course I said all of them. Um, so we're going to start, and by the way, I'm going to test you all, because the New York group was much better in guessing what the names of the songs I used than the San Francisco group, and we can figure that out. So we're going to start in the land of activities and outputs, right? And explore how this land created much of the structure, culture, and practices that we are now aiming to change. Today, we are in the midst, midst of the, anybody want to throw out a song title? What are we, where are we today? Anybody? Just, what? Not yet. <laughs> That's where we're going. So you did guess that right. They didn't guess that in San Francisco. OK? We are in the rising, right? An innovation lab creating a new social contract for outcomes. As today's session really demonstrated, the field is testing and implementing a host of innovations that hope to move us forward. And then we're going, what's your name? Jesse. Jesse, to the? Land of hopes. Yes, the land of hopes and dreams, where our system seeks and advances justice, which is the whole focus of this book. So you probably haven't paid much attention to the history chapters in this book, but I will tell you, unbiased, that the chapter that David wrote is one of the best things he's ever written in his career. So I really want to encourage you because they, it really begins to tell us what has been the history of social movements, community development, 
and poverty alleviation that has brought us to where we are today. I want to do one quote. Between the 1940s and the early 1970s, the U.S. poverty rate was estimated to drop from 33 percent to a low of 11 percent in 1973. Family income increased by 75 percent between 1945 and 1965. In the last 50 years, we have seen no change. And then we just released a huge paper today on the racial wealth divide, which shows you that we've actually gotten horribly worse on a whole host of wealth measures. So they also take us through the war on poverty, which is really critical to understand of how it began to change the paradigm step by step. And it really looked for the first time at how do you pair subsidies with market mechanisms? How do you understand that both people and place matter? Nothing could have been better than this panel of showing us that. And also really framing out what we've heard constantly throughout today is that no one person can solve these problems, that it's really a collective effort. And it really leads to a view that this business has been multi-sectoral from the get-go. Ian Galloway's captures a provocative truth when he says, contrary to popular belief, the social safety net was privatized long ago. So from there, it led us to the practice of categorical funding. We've heard multiple examples of the categorical funding, particularly in the case study that Scott shared on the homelessness issue in Seattle. And that has been framed in the book really as chaotic funding, which I think is an image that's incredibly powerful for why we haven't been able to solve problems, whether it's the homelessness problem in Seattle or a host of others. Yet we heard today from Mir Nutter and John Bridgelin how policymakers have worked to break this model at the local, state, and federal levels and shared the leap forward by the bipartisan evidence-based policy commission. But at the same time, Tyler Norris, who will be quoted multiple times because he is so eminently quotable, <laughs> had told us further tinkering will not work. Investment and policy strategy is necessary. So what matters? That's today. The presentations and conversations today really has chronicled how are leaders from the nonprofit, private, philanthropic, and public sectors creating this innovation lab. I love the way John Bridgelin said, the laboratories of American democracy are actually working. Or Shana, who I don't know if she's still here, shared, we need to over-communicate how we're doing these things. So what are the five lessons that I heard today? Lesson one starts with Lisa, which is changing the culture, right? How do we think about changing the culture that goes behind this? How do we reinvent how we share knowledge, how we train students, how we do work that's all accountable, and how we explain what really matters? Number two, and this was captured in this panel along with several of the other uh, presentations that were done before, how do we define and right-size the intervention to the outcome and really create new business models that achieve outcome goals? This is really the whole message of population health that Tyler shared before, but multiple others. The one line that I repeat ad nauseum to my staff that I learned in business school was the most critical thing is matching your sources and uses of funds. It sounds so simple, but that's in many ways what we're trying to do here. The other critical issue that Scott raised was when he talked about how contracting has really been designed not to achieve outcomes, but to prevent fraud, waste, and abuse. In our business, asset building, the single worst, most archaic policy 
is called asset limits, which many of you may know, where people who are getting any kind of public benefits can't have more than a very small amount of assets, which means they'll never move out of poverty if we have those asset limits. That's all to, to prevent fraud, waste, and abuse. So that really leads to how we have to change public policy so it recreates the incentive structure across the sectors that are changing the way we allocate and invest. Point number four is we need to build a new data infrastructure and the capacity to use it. There's an article in the book written by Jacob Harold, and I want to read a quote out of that that I've repeated multiple times. How we organize information matters for how we understand the world and how we act on it. Nowhere is this truer than in the work of social good. So how we think about this data, and Jim Bridgeland, John Bridgeland also shared how data has changed the conversation on SNAP, and I use this quote, with the Republicans saying, that gives me a different view. I thought that was the most hopeful statement of the whole day, <laughs> right? So let's give them different views on everything we're doing, all right? Then the last point here is financial information is the means, not the end, but let's fund the true cost of service delivery. What's Meals on Wheels all about? It was, how do you get, Lucy, sustainable funding for the future for what you do, right? And how do we think about this? At Prosperity Now, we have an incredible CFO, and he now has a policy that any funder that can't at least fund half of our overhead costs, we don't even go to. Because then we're not just losing 10 cents on the dollar, we're losing 20 or 25 cents, and it's really not worth it because then I just have to go fundraise more and more. So with that, let's finish up in the land of hopes and dreams. And that is the land that seeks and advances justice, or as David opened, every kid has bright eyes. And of course, that's the t-shirt that all of us need who are doing this work. So let me finish up with the key points that came out today. Almost done. The system that's oriented to outcome and results is really aiming for the ultimate good that we are seeking. This is just what would happen if we tailored healthcare like Amazon tailored your shopping bag. Great, great phrase of today. Number two, going back to Lisa's point, we have to engage communities to share in the rewards in this new system, and going back to Tyler's point, ensure they have both a physical and a mental home, and the influence and advocacy capacity to really ensure their participation and voices. At this table and many other places, we really heard the call for real leadership at the institutional level that cuts across all sectors and lines of business. We have to bust our silos and get the right people in the room. Then we have to craft our stories to reflect this new reality and that affirms and rewards these new behaviors. I want to take Janice's phrase when she describes that she's delivering the food and then she added the sentence, and then we chat. And in that little sentence was all the stories that we need to tell. Scott's story of the whole story of homelessness in Seattle, the most tech savvy place on the planet, and they can't get data, and they can't organize it. This is like my brother lives in Los Altos, right next to Palo Alto, and there's only Wi-Fi in one room. How can this be so, you know? And it's like, this is Los Altos. And, you know, Sergey Brené, whatever his name is, lives around the corner. So, anyhow. Finally, it's philanthropy and the role of philanthropy, which we heard many times. And really, how that role of helping us innovate and test new models 
can be integrated in market mechanisms once we have that risk capital. I want to end this point with really at, going back to Lucy's point about how she told the story of Meals on Wheels, which the meal is really just the entree into all the other things we're doing. So to end, Antony in his article has a great quote. We need a new narrative centered in a moral commitment that our society will do better for the poorest and most vulnerable people among us, and we need to organize this new narrative around mass success. Lisa then added the proverb, if you want to go far, go together. What Matters has taken a huge leap in really creating these new stories, and thanks to all of you who are going to bring this movement to success. Thank you. <laughs>